Li Shanjing at the staging post of preparing the brush. Apes and birds still tremble, fearing your commands. Wind and clouds still gather to protect your stronghold. As commander-in-chief, you wielded a lively brush, but your king rode away, a wagon to captivity. Your skills topped those of Guan and Yue, but how did your captains come to die so soon? Although a temple was built in your old hometown, the Liangfu lament is your true memorial. So we continue with yet one more of Li Shangjing's heptasyllabic regulated poems. Now this one, although it has some historical references, is a little bit less cryptic than some of the ones we've already encountered. So what's the topic of this poem? This, this poem is a homage, like many we've encountered before in this anthology, is a homage of Chu Liang, uh, the warlike Marquis, uh, who was one of the great historical figures of China, and he was one of the great figures of the period of the, of the Three Kingdoms, which would have been about 600 years before the time of, uh, of Li Shangjing. As I said, we've encountered previous poems by uh, Du Fu and others praising this figure. He was um, the subject of a cult, of a religious cult in Tang China, and uh, uh, I think he was also subjected to, to some, some rituals in the temples that rivaled, in a way, the, the scholarly officials, temples of Confucius, there were another temples uh, for, the, for the military men who passed their own examinations and they made similar uh, sacrifices to um, Chuge Liang, the warlike Marquis, in those temples. So he was a hero, he was a model, and he was used in the Tang as a symbol of the, of the virtuous uh, um, official uniting both martial skills and civil skills and uh, sustaining a falling, a declining house, because Chu Liang had managed to, to, to ensure for his uh, patron Liu Bei uh, the carving out of a, a territory in China during the Three Kingdoms period. Uh, the Kingdom of Shuhan was the one where, where uh, his patron Liu Bei continued as emperor, and where the Hang dynasty was given a little lease of life after its fall uh, as the dynasty dominating all of China. Uh, he would have been a special symbol and, and specially uh, admired and taken as a role model in periods of perceived decline. And, and this happens, this is probably happening uh, at the time of Li Shangying, who is witnessing, this poem is written in the 850s, he, he is witnessing the decline of the dynasty and the first signs of its impending doom. So he would probably like to step into into Chu Liang's shoes and become a savior of the dynasty. I think from what I read elsewhere that this poem was composed just like um, uh, Du Fu's were when Li Shangjing was passing from uh, coming back from an appointment and passing through Shu. Remember that's the territory uh, where uh, Chu Liang had carved a state for his ruler and it's, it corresponds to modern-day Sichuan. Okay, so the poem is a poem of praise, it's a paean of praise uh, towards uh, Chu Liang. Although in some aspects the praise gets balanced by the ultimate futility and failure of Chu Liang's efforts at restoring the Han Dynasty in the whole of China and at getting uh, his ruler and his descendants to rule for a long time. That was not to be the case. As is mentioned in this poem, the son of uh, Liu Bei, Liu Shan, lost his throne and was taken into exile into Luo, into Luoyang. But that was after the death of Chu Liang. Okay, so as usual, let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet. So the poem is titled, At the Staging Post of Preparing the Brush. So this would have been a staging post. Remember that Imperial China had these highways that were used for communicating all the cities with the, with the capitals with imperial scholar officials or, or any other functionaries serving the emperor on duty, being able to, 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 to use these uh, staging posts to maybe get horses and 
gallop towards the next staging post. And uh, this is one probably in Sichuan, and it's called the Preparing the Brush Staging Post because it was associated with uh, Chuge Liang. It was supposedly at this very same staging post that um, Chuge Liang had started preparing for, um, for, for becoming the Prime Minister of Emperor Liu Bei. And was, he was preparing the brush for his uh, clerical duties as Prime Minister of, uh, of the Han Emperor. So first couplet. Well, one interesting thing. Remember, in a regulated poem, the two middle couplets have to be strictly parallelistic. But in this poem, I think even the first couplet is parallelistic, as, as is witnessed by the translation. Apes and birds still tremble, fearing your commands. Winds and clouds still gather to protect your stronghold. So very clearly, apes and birds match wind and clouds, trembling, gathering, fearing, protecting, commands, stronghold. Now the first couplet uh, begins with a, this slightly hyperbolic, well not slightly, clearly hyperbolic image, which connects us with nature. Uh, remember the Chinese always like to connect nature and uh, society, the micro and the microcosm and the macrocosm. So the image we get in this couplet is that the natural realm of animals and, uh, and inanimate wind and clouds is still affected by the towering figure and prestige and commanding abilities of uh, Zhuge Liang even 600 years after his demise. So the apes and the birds still tremble fearing your commands as if the birds and the apes were the soldiers of his army. They still tremble 600 years later at imagining or thinking they hear the commands of the general. And also the wind and the clouds put themselves into the service of the general and they still act as protectors of his stronghold. They're like soldiers um, protecting the borders of the fortress of Chu Ge Liang. So this first image, you know, conveys, as I said, rather hyperbolically, that even nature after a long period of time is still in the thraldom of Chu Ge Liang's military might and his command. Okay, let's continue with the second couplet. One interesting thing that will take place in both the second, the third, and the fourth couplets is that each couplet presents, you could say, uh, you could say um, a, a contrast. Not not only in the middle, in the middle two couplets, the, the the parallelistic antithesis that is necessary, but but there's also the first line presents a positive aspect of uh, Chu Ge Liang and his endeavors, and the second line undermines this positiveness with some negativeness. And this will happen, as I said, in, in the three succeeding couplets. So second couplet. As commander-in-chief, you wielded a lively brush, but your king rode a wagon to captivity. So uh, this couplet centers on, 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 on Chu Ge Liang as minister. And, you know, he says, you were the commander-in-chief of the armies and of, of the government. And you acted, this wielding the lively brush would have mean, you know, you made a lot of edicts and, and you took the necessary measures. But still, even though you were a good prime minister, a good general, this was not enough because your king rode a wagon to captivity. So, uh, as I said before, um, uh, Chuge Liang was a rather successful military commander and prime minister for Emperor Liu Bei. After Emperor Liu Bei died, he served as a regent of sorts to his son, uh, Liu Shan, but he died, and after he died, a few years later, quite a few, I think, uh, Liu Shan had a relatively uneventful but relatively long reign as well. After a few decades, though, his uh, the kingdom of Shu Han was overrun by um, by uh, the kingdom. I think it was still then uh, Cao Wei, even though all power had devolved into the hands of uh, of, of of the Shao clan, which would eventually depose. The, the, the last puppet way ruler. But anyway, um, after some military campaigns that probably took place in the 240s, 250s uh, of our era, uh, the king, who had been served last by Chu Ge Liang, had to go into, was defeated and surrendered and was taken in a wagon to the enemy capital. So you could say Chu Ge Liang's efforts were in vain. Yes, you were a great minister, a great planner, a great general, but what did it serve you? What success was, uh, what success followed in the train 
of your abilities if the ruler, the last ruler you served, had to go to captivity and his line of rulers was broken forever. Third parallelistic couplet. Uh, this is a similar one, uh, but now it centers not on the minister himself and the king he served, but on exemplary ministers from the past and generals from the present. Your skills topped those of Guan and Yue. But how did your captains come to die so soon? So he was he is compared with two exemplars of the past. Mm, Guan refers to Guan Zhong and uh, Yue refers to Yue Ji. Both were important ministers in the Eastern Zhou period, the period of decline of, of, of the power of the of the Zhou monarchs, but of, of many small feudal states that were to all points and purposes independent. So Guan Zhong was the prime minister of Duke Huan of Qi, and he was a very able minister, and in fact is given credit for pushing his ruler to become the first of the hegemons. Uh, he was the first of the five hegemons that, to all intents and purposes, acted like kings during the spring and autumn period. He's also compared to Zhui Ji. Zhui Ji was from the later part of the Eastern Zhou period, from the Warring States, and he was a minister of the state of uh, Jen, which was uh, the most insignificant and weakest of the warring states. Yet he was so intelligent and able that uh, he managed to concoct a coalition of different states against the bigger state of Qi, invading it and almost destroying it, almost having it annexed by Yen. So two good exemplars from the, mm, from the past. They both um, underline how the skills of Zhuge Liang were massive. And yet these skills were not enough. But how did your captains come to die so soon? So here in the original, the names of captains subordinate to Zhuge Liang are mentioned, but there, I don't know anything about them, but they, they probably died before Zhuge Liang. So, so even though he was as good as past ministers, he wasn't able to save his own generals and, and, and therefore establish possible successors who might continue his work after his death. Last couplet. Although a temple was built in your old hometown, the Liang Fu lament is your true memorial. So temples were built in homage of uh, Chu Liang in different places, but of course in his hometown and in other places as well. Uh, so, so this last couplet does not really contrast the vir one, one virtuous and one negative aspect of Chu Liang. It rather, but, but it also makes a contrast in that there are these temples to homage you, but the real homage, the real memorial, is not in these physical buildings. It's in the Liang Fu lament. Now the Liang Fu lament was a a ballad, a classical ballad, a Joy Fu. And it's associated with Chuge Liang because the, the chronicles say that Chuge Liang liked to recite it a lot. And uh, it's the story, well, the contents are not particularly relevant perhaps to Chuge Liang himself, but it's the story, it's a narrative ballad, so it's the story of um, how a minister of the state of Qi conspires or plots to have three worthy men die because you know they're they're too too martial and, uh, and 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 able, and he feels they are a threat to his ruler. So you know he concocts a rouse that is similar to the one that begins the Trojan War in our east, uh, sorry, in our Western myths. Like he he decides that two peaches are going to be given to the most martial and the most meritorious warriors. Uh, the one of the three uh, virtuous warriors who doesn't get it commits suicide and the others afterwards also commit suicide because they're ashamed at having received the peaches and, and the dead one not having received them himself. So it's just a, you would say it's just a poem on lamenting the fall of virtuous men to plots and to bad luck. And I imagine that's the element of the ballad that might resonate with Chu Liang, but it would also resonate in this case with Li Shangjing who would, of course, consider himself one of those virtuous men, virtuous officials who has been trampled down by bad fortune and who is not able to serve his ruler as he wished.